Here we are, uh, video seven of the respiratory system and the last one. So, uh, factors that influence breathing rate and depth. So, how fast do you breathe and why? How deep do you breathe and why? There are chemical factors which uh, are due to chemoreceptors. A chemoreceptor is just a chemical detecting nerve ending. And you have these in your uh, brain and in your large arteries like your aorta and carotid arteries. And these are the uh, two main ones here, right? So carbon dioxide actually is the most important stimulus. If you start, let's let's just say you take you take a breath and hold it. So maybe while I'm talking, take a breath and hold it. Go right now. Take a breath and hold it. All right. Now as I talk, you're going to be noticing that you're probably going to, you know, get some stress at first, and you'll say, okay, I I would like to take a breath, and then after another couple seconds, you might be like, I'd really like to take a breath, and pretty soon you're just going to go like that. That urge to take that breath is due to a buildup of carbon dioxide in your blood. As soon as you start breathing, you start dumping that carbon dioxide. Now, you might think, why is carbon dioxide the most important stimulus? Shouldn't it be oxygen? Well, again, if you're building up carbon dioxide in your lungs, it's most likely because you're holding your breath. An evolutionary from an evolutionary viewpoint right you weren't breathing carbon dioxide in and out um, you weren't breathing a zero oxygen atmosphere probably so it's usually because you're holding your breath and the co2 sensors are very very uh, sensitive if your blood has too much carbon dioxide you have hypercapnia and hypercapnia can cause some serious problems uh, it'll drop the pH of your blood and it uh, will cause other, you know, uh, neurological, short-term neurological issues, which you can re rectify in most cases by breathing. Hypocapnia is too little CO2. So if you do really deep, you know, fairly rapid breaths, you're going to be dumping CO2. And if you've ever hyperventilated, I never have, but I've seen it on sitcoms where somebody freaks out and then they start getting dizzy and sit down and somebody puts a paper bag over their mouth uh, you're gonna be rebreathing co2 well that hypocapnia basically is a signal that you've that you're breathing enough and you'll actually stop you know if you if you take a couple of super deep breaths before you try to hold your breath you're gonna last a lot longer than if you just go straight on right because you'll dump a lot of that co2 like I said pressure, the partial pressure of oxygen is not as important. You have a lot of reserve. Remember how I said that you don't even deplete your oxygen supplies when the blood goes through your uh, circuit. Um, and you can actually tolerate fairly low oxygen levels in most of your tissues. pH and CO2 are linked. Low pH is probably due to high CO2, but you do have pH sensors. So if, you, if the pH sensors go off and the CO2 sensors go off, you're going to say, okay, breathe, and you'll probably fix that problem. Oh, interestingly, you remember when I talked about carbon monoxide poisoning? Well, if you're breathing carbon monoxide, if you're just going and breathing in and out, you're dumping CO2. So by the time your O2 sensors kick in, you're probably already losing consciousness in that carbon monoxide atmosphere. Same thing works with other gases. If don't go into a tent that's full of helium. Don't just breathe nitrous oxide, okay? That's a good way to kill yourself. Higher brain centers. If you're angry or scared, you're probably going to, you know, if you've ever been scared in a, in a haunted house or by a movie or the uh, actor in a movie gets frightened by a monster, they're right afterwards they're like, oh, oh, right? That's that's the, the, the higher brain centers kicking in. And that makes sense. If there's a monster, you want to be all, you know, oxygened, oxygened up. If you're calm and relaxed and your brain's all mellow, you're going to take much slower, shallower breaths. This is how you meditate. If you want to you want to get some sleep and you're unable to rest think of something the most peaceful thing you can think of and concentrate on taking deep or not deep but slow breaths and you can take a deep one here or there uh, if you hold your breath because you don't want to eat your broccoli 
your medulla is going to override that. It's going to say, forget you, you're going to breathe, and it'll make you exhale. Again, pulmonary irritants can cause some weird breathing, and then there's an opposite effect of what's called the inflation reflex. If you take too deep of a breath, it's going to kind of send signals to your brain telling you to tap the brakes because you don't want to stretch or damage any tissue. How does exercise and altitude affect you? Well, interestingly, exercise, when you do it, increases the breathing rate and depth of breathing. You can visualize that. However, if you're in good shape because you've been doing a lot of aerobic exercise, when you're at rest, you're going to even have slower breaths. You're, if you're in really good cardiovascular shape, your uh, respiratory rate is going to be lower than 12 breaths per minute, which isn't a bad thing. That's good. Um, if you go to elevation, go up to Aspen or something, um, the gas pressures all go down, including oxygen, so you're going to have this lower gradient, which means that you're going to get what's what can be called acute mountain sickness. So you're going to get altitude sickness. You might have heard it, right? Uh, I've never gotten these first three, but I got this last one, right? It's I felt okay. I was in pretty good shape when I went to Flagstaff, which is pretty high, and uh, I was running and stuff, and I felt it was tiring. It got tired easier, but uh, I didn't ever get a headache or anything. But man, a couple beers, watch out. If you stay at altitude for a long time, you acclimatize, so you become accustomed to it. And this is why a lot of uh, athletic training centers are at elevation. You'll put them on a mountain somewhere and make people run, you know, quarters on a mountain. It's going to do you a lot more good than running quarters at sea level. Uh, the, your body's response is to build more blood vessels. That's what angiogenesis is. To build more blood cells. That's what erythropoiesis is. And you can even pack in some more mitochondria. So your whole, your whole cardiovascular system and respiratory system get better at dealing with, the, with that elevation. Uh, some people actually get evolutionarily better at it. Um, Sherpas, a group of people that live in the uh, Himalayas, uh, at, at really high elevations, that's where they spend their days, have got a genetic genetically larger number of red blood cells. They, they basically have evolved at elevation. Last slide is homeostatic imbalances. I'm not going to list them all. Let me see if anything here seems interesting. You have to know these. Uh, you've heard of COPDs before. Uh, simple, simple, simple. Mm, tuberculosis. Uh, tuberculosis is a bacterial infection, which isn't that common anymore, but you still get TB vaccines and they give you TB tests because uh, it's really dangerous. You can treat it now, but back in the 1800s and 1700s and whatever, it was not treatable. So if you got tuberculosis, you were probably, unless, you know, you managed to rebound from it uh, naturally, you were probably in for a long kind of slow spiral down the drain. <clears throat> uh, famously, Doc Holliday, uh, the Western gunfighter guy had tuberculosis. And whenever you get it, you'll you'll go to these coughing fits where blood and sputum will come out of your mouth and that's how your friends get it. Uh, same thing with uh, COVID-19, by the way. They don't have tubercles, but that you can spread it that same way from particulate matter. Lung cancer, too many types to go into. Most of them are due to smoking. So if you're a smoker, I strongly advise you to stop. It dramatically increases your chances of getting lung cancer, which uh, I can tell you from a, uh, from not firsthand because I never had it, but from a personal point of view, that dying from lung cancer is not fun for you or your family. So stop it. Just stop it. This might be of use to, of interest to somebody or to some of us, sleep apnea. So apnea is just cessation of breathing. Sleep apnea is during sleep, right? And a lot of time this is mostly obstructive. So obstructive means that your soft palate, uh, your throat's basically gonna block your own breathing, especially if you're laying on your back, uh, especially if you've got certain comorbidities, um, oftentimes obesity is one of them. But this, causes you to not get good sleep. You may feel like you slept all night, but you woke yourself up a dozen, two dozen, three dozen times. 
and it can kill you. People can die from this. So they, that's what CPAP machines and they have surgeries that'll address this. Uh, and then there's a central sleep apnea, which is going to be a neurological problem, something to do with your respiratory centers, but that's much less common. All right, that's it for the lecture material on the uh, respiratory system. You'll notice that there is a actual lecture of me standing in a room, which uh, you'll get those for the rest of the semester as ancillary material. All right, thanks. Good luck. Study hard. Email me.